Okay, thank you. Are you co-host? Uh, no, no, sir. You you are the host actually, and after you will share the screen, I'll become the host again, and then I'll enter, uh, allow the participants to come in. Actually, it is a free version, so it doesn't have, huh. give the option of post. Okay, that's why. Yeah, yes. yeah this is a, a screen is visible uh, and it is on the full screen mode. Yes. So, so this will disconnect in 45 minutes. No, no, it will not disconnect. Actually, uh, this is from my university mail ID. So we do not have the time restraint. Only the participation can be at the 100. We can accommodate 100 participants ah, in a meeting, then but no, uh, is time is not restrained. So this is, the, yes. so, so this uh, is basic version. This is not free version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sir. So shall I uh, allow the participants? To, Yes, you want me to stay off you, while you do introduction or what you want? Yeah, yeah, sir. First, I'll introduce you and then we can go ahead with the session. Can I make screen No, no, you can make it on, no issue. The participants are joining up. Okay. Few more participants are joining. Uh, with your kind permission, shall we go ahead, sir? Uh, should I? Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, good afternoon, you all. A warm welcome to you all again in this session. And in this session, we had a a great eminent elite speaker, uh, elite professional, and a very good uh, physiotherapy students even, student even, a good uh, researcher, a good teacher, an international teacher, Dr. Prakash Sharof sir. Dr. Prakash Sharof sir, the name itself is very enough for the introduction, but still, uh, let me uh, take an opportunity to introduce our resource person of this international physiotherapy conference session of the recent Advances in the orthopedic and manual physical therapy. Dr. Sharof sir has done their specialization in orthopedics, sports and manual therapy from Australia. He has been trained in the pilots, western acupuncture and dry needling from Australia itself. He is a director of physio health pain management and performance enhancement center. And he is also a lead instructor of the physio health research and training institute, Mumbai. He is also a Consulting physical therapist for the Olympic Gold Quest, member of Indian Association of Physical Therapists, and he has been registered for practice in India as well as in Australia. So he is one of the few physiotherapists who has the license to get practice into the worldwide. And he is also an official instructor, first in Asia, for the Neuro Orthopedic Institute. He has numerous awards and achievements during their academic life. Few of them I would like to uh, enlist. He has received Mary Harmon Prize in 2007 for their highest achievement in their PG pro during their PG program via Australian Physical Therapy Association which we usually refer during our uh, researches and studies and by, by the University of South Australia. So it is a matter of real pressure, uh, pleasure and proud honor for us being a physiotherapist, being an Indian physiotherapist, he has been a winner of this award, a very prestigious award. And he had a, a huge work experience uh, for more than uh, 15 years. And he is also an ex-director of a sports physical therapy unit at Exercise Science Laboratory and Rehab Center, Kasturba Hospital, Mumbai. <coughs> he had a great experience in dealing with the various orthopedic sports and manual therapy conditions. He had a very good teaching experience for around more than a decade and has assisted Michel Copiators on mobilization on the nervous system, which is held in the Mumbai in 2010. 
and there are lots of achievements by the name of dr prakash sherof sir and we are really grateful to you sir that you have uh, spared your such a precious time to share your incredible knowledge with us you have uh, so much busy schedule still uh, you agreed and you are uh, sharing your expertise with us with the attendees over here so we are really grateful to you sir thanking you tell uh, thanking you sir and warm welcome to you again over to you sir thank you dr himanshu and dr harsh for organizing this beautiful conference in these times it's always good to keep updating ourselves and any new information is always useful and learning never stops every now and then if i get an opportunity to attend something i would always love to attend because that one or two key things which someone might teach you definitely helps practice and you get better results so it's an ongoing process which should never stop now the topic given to me by all was recent advances in uh, orthopedic and manual therapy my slide is visible clearly to you all yes sir so we are visible uh, yes sir visible i will hide myself so that people can focus on the slide so in orthopedic and manual therapy our field has advanced a lot from the time i went to australia in 2005 to now i have seen a big transition starting with the trend of manual therapy brought about by dr mohanty and dr deepak kumar and then came in many more concepts like uh, mckenzie maligen by dr kumar maitland's concept by dr mohanty dry needling came in in the past few years we used to work with rigid taping now we saw kinesio taping and today i am going to talk about a new concept called dynamic tape so that's one of the new concepts we are introducing and the other concept is actually a concept by david butler neuro orthopedic institute we know david butler who used to talk about the nervous system and his book mobilization of the nervous system so we know know him as the guy who spoke of neurodynamics he has now taken the journey from the nerves to the brain and explored pain so we'll be talking about the concept of explain pain and graded motor imagery which are the two new courses that noy offers in terms of understanding pain and treating pain and this is applicable not only to your acute conditions but also to the chronic conditions which we call fibromyalgia crps etc so i'm taking you from one passive technique called dynamic tape to a very advanced version of pain management where you first understand pain better and then the therapy laid down for it called graded motor imagery so let me start so first dynamic tape is different from kinesio tape and rigid tape in terms of its function it is a biomechanical tape we use this tape to manage load if okay. taping has been used for various reasons the primary reason is biomechanical where we use tape to modify movement or to create or resist an accessory motion and most of the time we use a rigid tape or an elastic tape sometimes kinesiology tape as well so this is the primary thing we have used tape for and there is research which shows in emgs and kinematic studies that do we do achieve these effects more with rigid tapes to a lesser extent with tapes that stretch the second most important effect of taping is neurophysiological that is pain relief so we know taping is an a beta stimulus which will inhibit a delta c and cause pain relief taping has an amazing proprioceptive effect because that feedback on skin with tape tends to enhance proprioception a little bit of lymphatic and motor control system activation also happens this is all via its use of the tapes however there are limitations here with the rigid tape the elastic tape and the kinesio tape after you stretch them to such the function they do not are at their optimal limit they reduce capacity to dissipate load and the load to a great extent there are possible balance strategies in fact 
some studies have shown balance to a function and of it does wear out eventually and becomes when it shortens which is not happening with the other tapes it does stretch four way to make the stretch more comfortable though along its length it will stretch much more than its breadth having said that stretching in all directions makes it easier to absorb the load whereas the canisio stretch two ways the rigid does not stretch this is normally applied in the shortened position and these are action here is load absorption compared to others which was shown to be increased in the preparation for the task during the task and after the task of sitting on the computer so upper trapezius showed excessive activity now with that as you can see over here this is called the cervical of load technique we reduce the stress on the trapezius muscle and after that there was a reduction in emg activity post the tape as well other tapes the tape being a little stretchy is a lot more comfortable and a lot less restrictive and can provide the same force closure like we would want in an area like the ankle or the sacroiliac joint okay a study in fact done on elite volleyballers for ankle instability they examined functional and balance test and there was significant improvement post taping with dynamic taping so these are examples of force closure with dynamic tape this is the ankle technique this is the wrist technique for the wrist joint and on the fingers so looking at a tape which is so elastic and stretches so much we would assume will it give enough support will it cause enough hold to cause a force closure yes it does when it is put circumferentially around the limb of course it has to be at an angle and we have to be careful that we do not cause restriction of circulation in that area so our technique has to be good handling has to be good and it also helps in reducing the load on soft tissue now we have done box taping with rigid tape where we bunch tissues up and reduce the stress there which has shown to work there have been techniques done for tennis elbow with the same and dynamic taping can also be used to achieve the same so we are reducing the stress in the area by bunching up the tissues and also enhancing the circulation over there by reducing the relative stress soft tissue overload techniques can be used for decurvings at the thumb and many other places wherever you want to reduce the sensitivity of the nervous tissue as well bunching the tissues can reduce the stresses there reduce the tension there not only on the other structures but also on the neural structures so what are our aims here we know that tissues fail not because of pain because of load and thus failure of due under load leads to pain so the main thing here is looking at managing is this load decelerating or accelerating or reducing the load and thus reducing the pain that's why it is called the biomechanical tape so the focus is manage load change movement pattern or function and thus take care of the pain so a few examples so how do we plan taping with the dynamic tape we need to have an aim let's say patellofemoral pain when we are looking at patellofemoral pain we are looking at the knee joint we know the stresses increase in knee flexion so we want to give some assistance 
in a way that the stress on the patella goes down during knee flexion in the weight bearing position and of course axis of rotation will be along the knee joint line up will be along the muscles because the quadriceps is working very hard and we would like to reduce the load on the quadriceps or assist its function positioning would be in a shortened position so knee extension leverage to get a better effect the tape should be really long spreading on both sides of the knee joint if we go just a little above and below the knee joint the lever arm will be really small and the tape will not be effective enough so a long tape almost going from upper thigh to lower shin would have a long lever arm and can give a lot more support and in the end we need test we check spotting to check if the tape is absorbing the load giving an elastic recoil to push back into extension and thus aiding pain relief by reducing stress on the patellofemoral joint skin reactions are very common with lot of the tapes less likely with this tape because it is quite stretchy quite porous it allows air and water to pass through it however not all tapes suit everyone some people's skin might still react so usual instructions if it is causing any irritation itchiness the tape should be removed there could be contact dermatitis well in a place like mumbai where we tend to sweat a lot and it's humid irritation due to sweat accumulating around the tape could be a problem so just keeping the area clean and take care of this mechanical irritation now this is something which is very specific to dynamic tape because this happens not from the tape but from bad technique if you end up applying tape with a lot more pressure on certain areas the edges of the tape start cutting into it remember this tape has no rigid end point it is not going to stop you from moving and hence it's going to keep stretching but at the same time keep cutting into the areas if the technique is incorrect so this problem happens only with incorrect technique not because of a fault in the properties of the tape so or the reaction of the skin this is something you need to be very careful of so a simple example of upper limb offload tape put on both sides now in this case if we want to cause a lift effect of the shoulder or the humerus into the glenoid we would be taping on the front and back now for the front tape we would be taking the arm in flexion for the hind tape we will be taking the in extension remember we tape in the shortened position as the tape is let the taping is done and the arm is brought back to neutral there is a pull effect into the tape which will pull the head of humerus into the glenoid so this is just explaining at a basic level how you would think about taping using a dynamic tape this can also be used to restrict end range of rotations in certain activities and you can see that they can go through almost full range with the resistance increasing as the tape stretches reaching an end point where the resistance is maximum but at the same time the movement is possible you don't hit a rigid end point in movement this is the knee extension i was talking about for patella femoral pain a nice long tape your axis of rotation is here the lever arm is quite big and that's why the long length of the tape now imagine instead of this tape think i have put a theraband on the leg what will happen if you have a theraband on the front of your leg when you bend the theraband will stretch so as such it is absorbing or sharing the load with your muscles and that leads to less stress on the patellofemoral joint at the same time when you come back to extension the tape will contract or shorten just like the theraband so in a way it will push the knee back into extension and thus this elastic recoil will aid the quadriceps action so you are not only reducing the load during the eccentric phase you are providing extra support or facility the concentric phase it is a biomechanical effect and thus reducing the stress on the quadriceps on the patellar femoral joint leading to reduction in pain so that was talking about the passive technique which was the new thing that we have come across in terms of taping now i'm going to take you to a very hands off approach and talk about pain and brain now we all know pain exists in the periphery and it starts always after an injury but i am going to try and change that notion over here and take you to the journey around the nervous system and the entire body to understand pain better now at any point 20% have pain that is persists more than 3 months which is where we call them to be having chronic pain 
because we know most of the tissues, including bones, should heal by three months. However, when you think of hypnosis being used as anesthesia, you can imagine pain can be controlled without physical intervention at the injured area. So there is something that can control it from within. In short, pointing to the power of the role of the nervous system and the brain in pain. We know that the amount of pain does not relate to the tissue damage. Sometimes minor injuries cause excruciating pain and people survive major injuries without much complaint. We all have seen that in our experience. In the absence of pain, changes in the tissues are not perceived as threat. Very important here. We know the knees are wearing out as we age. Whatever the x-ray findings comes up are actually taken when someone's in pain. That does not mean these changes were not happening till now. And that does not mean that those changes are actually causing pain. So we need to make sure that is responsible for the pain. A very important point here. This is what changed my life. All pain is real. All pain is normal. Now we often believe a pain when we see the history of an injury or there is a physical damage, physical insult, physical sign present. The tissue healing time, we start thinking, is this in their head? Well, it's not pain in their head. The pain is still real, but we need to understand the process behind it. How is it still existing? Now look at this lady. The pain starts in my husband's back, travels up his spine to his neck, comes out of his mouth into my ears. And that's why I get these headaches. Now we would assume these headaches are not real. This sounds like a husband's pain, not her pain. Of course, these are real. If her husband is complaining constantly about his pain, she is getting very anxious listening to it and she's getting headaches. Can we treat a headache? Yes. Can we treat the headaches by treating her only? No. We need to treat her, but her husband should. So if we don't believe the story, we will never want to treat her. If we believe the story, we know treatment is required for her and for the husband. And this, we are very happy with patients who follow this simple remodeling healing and eventually as the healing happens the pain goes down the patients react like this we feel our interventions have done well this is a healing point but the pain doesn't seem to go that's where we wonder what's wrong this is where we probably categorize them into pain in their head chronic pain psychosomatic pain i'm not lying The gate control theory of pain and answer. If pain was something from the periphery, let's drop it there. A delta and C, small fibers carrying the pain impulse. Let's use A beta to block them. There will be no pain. But I spoke of something called descending pain inhibition system where nobody explored much, but yes, they left a clue. There is something from up there which can influence your pain. It's not. All the gate control theory failed. Why can't we use tends to treat all pains? Because it does not talk anything about that descending pain inhibition system or the brain power. It does not explain phantom limb pain. What do you do about a limb that is not existing and still hurting? Where will you put the tense electrodes? Does not explain inflammation, does not talk about immune system, and does not go to the depths of chronic pain. So this is where this theory was not the answer to all our pains but to some our pains and we needed to look for more. Now we all know the tissue paradox. Our MRIs don't depict what we feel and vice versa. We know that what we see or the state of the human tissue will not necessarily relate to the pain we are feeling. Which points again that there is more to it than this tissue change. What about emotional pain? You all have seen Gajani. Early morning when he removes his t-shirt to remind himself of the revenge he wants to take. He is in excruciating pain, but that's an emotional pain. How is it different from physical pain? Where is the center for emotional pain? How is pain represented in the brain? Now we introduce a new term here called neuromatrix or neurotag. Every pain has
has a signature, has its own limits. What is its relevance? We can explain with the example of phantom limping. Now you all are aware of this motor homunculus. We have someone losing a limb. This guy is attending a marriage function, just got out of his car, crossing the road. The sight of the venue, the lights, the music, the beautiful board, honking traffic, signal lights. He does not notice while crossing a truck suddenly comes, honks, and over. When he is up, he finds himself in the hospital and his leg is gone. Now imagine that point where he got hit by the car. How many centers were working? He saw the board. He saw the lights. He probably noticed the weather that day. He was listening to the music playing at the wedding hall. His memory is probably of his friend whose wedding he was going for. His emotions, his feelings, the sound of the truck honk, the signal, all that formed a part of the experience where he lost his leg. Now, post-surgery, he does not have the leg physically, but he does have the leg up there in his homunculus. Now, what we are talking about is all these points were active at that point when he got hit by the truck and lost his leg. Now, this is his neurosignature for that accident where he lost his leg. Similarly, we have a neurosignature for each and every other pain experience. Now, how can he get pain in the leg? not present. Now he may not have the and because of that lag like in the motor homunculus if he is thinking about it, imagining it, talking about it, maybe the honk of the truck, any center which relates to that episode can actually ignite this whole neuro signature and he can get the pain in the leg which is absent. That's why they can get pain during dreaming while talking about it, visiting the same place, hearing the same honk, the same season, the same time, the signal light. All of these can ignite the whole neuro signature and you can get pain. You can imagine how powerful this is. So when you see pain, it does not just involve your sensory motor area and the thalamus. We have many more areas involved and these are just common areas used in day-to-day -day life. The visual, auditory, memory, everything gets involved in a, every pain experience. And they have neurons which keep giving feedback to each other. And that's why memory can aggravate pain or start a pain response. Emotion can start a pain response. Sight can start a pain response. Hearing can start a pain response. Okay? This representation, ignition is not dependent on the tissue. So he doesn't have to always feel pain in the leg because it started there. And the fact is he does not have the leg. But any of these could become the ignition to start the whole signature. Emotional pain will look very much like physical pain. Now in these days, we do something called functional MRI, which picks up the number of areas that are showing activity during an experience. So when you see physical pain, you will see a lot of areas ignited. And as I said, it is not restricted to the sensory motor area and the thalamus, as we would like to believe. It involves many more areas of the brain. And I'm sure if you were to check for emotional pain, you'll find quite a similar picture. These ignited areas can be modified. Now let me give you a very, very simple example. We have this Mohavra Tooth Ka Jala Chhas Puk Puk Ke Pita Hai. So first time you sip a cup of hot milk. Every other time you see a cup of milk, you will assume it is hot and blow on it. So what happened the first time? First time you sipped on hot milk, your tongue got burned, you registered a neuro signature, white liquid in a cup, hot, tongue burn giving you a very simple example. Now this neurosignature next time gets ignited when you see white liquid, milk. Your neurosignature makes you feel uneasy. Last time I sipped on it, my tongue burned. What do I do now? This ignited neurosignature can be turned off. So what we do is we blow on that white milk. Once we blow, that hot becomes cold. Once we switch off one ignition node, the neurosignature turns off. We feel secure, we feel safe, and we sip. This is probably what we are doing with most of our patients. Whether we are massaging, mobilizing, putting ultrasound, we keep telling them this is what will help improve circulation, improve healing, reduce pain. In a way, every pain experience has a neurosignature. Doing ultrasound and an 
acutely sprained ankle and telling them this is anti-inflammatory, you are turning off the inflammation part of the neurosignature. Very powerful. So each and every person, every patient you have treated, you are working with their pain neurosignature. If it works well, you turn them off successfully, pain relief happens. But this becomes challenging when dealing with someone who is in the chronic stage or gone into a complex region pain syndrome. Another interesting thing that happens when pain persists for too long or due to inactivity is mudging. This is a process that happens in the brain. So I'll give you an example. You tie your two fingers together. In half an hour, your brain will show only one finger. You open the fingers up and start moving them, you will get the representation back. Why does this smudging happen? It's a protective mechanism. Now imagine if your thumb is hurt really bad and the pain is excruciating. Your brain thinks that this pain is too much for a small area to handle. It will start distributing the pain around onto your fingers, palm, wrist. And you wonder, this does not make sense dermatologically. The dermatomes do not match the spread of pain. Why not? Because this is how it's presented in the brain. The brain is spreading it according to the presentation there to the nearest available area to reduce the intensity per area. Thus reduce the intensity of pain a particular area will go through. And that's why there is non-dermatomic spread of pain. Now this is happening not only in pain, also happens with immobilization or lack of activity. And not only we are giving people more range in the joint, more flexibility into the muscles when we give them exercise, we are also refreshing their homunculus. Now this occurs normally. You will see that musicians, blind people using braille, they have bigger fingers in the motor homunculus. Numerous injury states like phantom limb pain will show you a change in the homunculus. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, just body taping that we do can change the presentation which comes back when you open the tape and start moving the fingers separately. So our new definition of pain. It's a multiple system output constructed by an individual specific pain neurosignature, which is constructed when the brain concludes the body is in danger and action is required. And neurosignature includes the body part. So yes, pain is not just a sensory motor phenomenon. It is an experience created by the brain as a person in your current environment after balancing whether there is more danger or more safety. Now the same brain or the same pain experience will be different in the jungle when you are running away to save your life from a wild animal and you end up twisting your ankle, some sharp objects pricking your foot, you won't care. At this time, survival is important. So these physical injuries don't matter. But at the same time, if you are in a safe setup and you're doing some nice art and craft and a paper cuts your finger, it can be excruciating. Well, yes, it's a safe environment. Your priority is to save your finger. If this finger is not saved, then you may not be able to do more craft or your daily activities. And hence, the pain is a lot more. So you see how the pain or the amount of pain is a balance between the amount of safety and danger and just does not depend on how much injury has happened to a body part. There is more to it than that. Now, let me ask you something. Have a look at the images that are going to come up and think in your mind, will this hurt? An insect bite? Of course, when we see this bite happening, it can hurt. But often we get up in the morning and see a lot of reactions on our feet and hands and we realize we've been bitten. That's when we start feeling itchy. When we see such a big squirling, of course, it hurts a lot. Until we see this building up, till then it doesn't hurt so much maybe. Of course, this can be really painful. Knee going the other way, shoulder twisting the other way. This is a different example. This is too much for us to handle. In a situation like this one and this one, there is a good chance that your brain will shut off and make you unconscious because this is too much for you to handle. And you may not feel this pain until you are up and someone comes and describes in detail what hell your body went through. Till then, maybe you are protected because not knowing this is better for you than knowing this. Here's a boy who does not feel pain. Now we would assume he's the luckiest boy on earth, but he has to be really careful because he will not know when he gets burned, pricked, twists, this something, breaks something. So in fact, pain is important because pain is a defender. It is a defense. It's going to protect you. And that's the important part. 
It's a protector. Look at this. Somebody is really happy after multiple folks. So how can pain be a negative notion? People get these things done willingly. Do they not hurt? They look really excruciating when you see them on picture. So thus pain is a normal response to what your brain thinks is a threat. Very important word here. Your brain weighs the balance between danger and safety and then decides based on your current situation, you as a person, what is required? Should we give you pain? Should we take care of you and not give you pain? We know the amount of pain does not relate to amount of damage. You can see it in the pictures. And this re relies on many cues. As I mentioned in the neurosignature example, your phantom limb pain serves as a reminder. So we spoke of now the role of brain in pain and pain being an experience. Now let's take this further to our patients who have reached this chronic stage. What do we do for them? Your fibromyalgia, your CRPS. So we talked a lot about understanding this pain in a course called explain pain. And the hands-on part or the treatment part is the next stage called graded motor imagery. Now this has got three parts, left right discrimination, explicit imagery and mirror therapy. It's a protocol which has been published and this is to be followed in every case which has become chronic. The first thing is people in chronic pain, they lose their ability to recognize left and right. Very hard to believe, but it is fact for those who have been suffering for so long. The brain does not recognize the part involved is right or left because it's getting too much information or maybe it has just decided to ignore that part because it's hurting a lot. Left-right discrimination is a problem. Try it out. Not having pain, let's see how good you are. Now as I bring up the pictures, think in your mind, is it left, is it right? Okay. So if you are normal, your accuracy will be above 80% and the response time normally is 1.6 seconds plus minus 0.5 seconds for the spine and 2 plus minus 0.5 seconds for the periphery or the hand and foot. Of course, in terms of chronic pain, we also take qualitative information about how do you feel and you'll be surprised in CRPS people are not able to judge this. Now you went through a mental activity of looking at the image probably Visualizing your hand in that position and figuring out left and right. Maybe you even position your hand that way. Now for someone in chronic pain to do this process takes time. And that's why they are not able to judge it in the correct time or they're not able to judge it correctly at all because they have so much pain. Imagine the homunculus smudging. They do not have a clear impression of the part in the brain. They find it difficult to reply to these questions. In terms of spying on the neck, we look at whether the person is moving to the left or the right. The second stage we take them through is called explicit imagery, which is imagining movements. Now these are people where moving the path is not possible because of the amount of pain and the chronicity of pain. So we take them a step back to start rehab. We take them into the level of imagining movements where all the activity is happening only in the brain. Very important statement here. A man is not idle because he is involved in his thoughts. There is visible labor and invisible labor. And believe me, this invisible labor is laborious. So where are we here on the graph? This is our real movements, which we start with normally. Range of motion, assisted motion, the lightest exercise we could give someone. But we are not talking about this here because in chronic pain, even assisted movement could be painful. We are taking a step back. We are taking it, looking at people move, judging left and right, imagining movements, then using mirror therapy. So when you observe movement, you still have enough activity in all the brain centers. When you imagine there is a little more activity and of course maximum activity when you perform movements. So just not actively performing a movement doesn't mean nothing. Observing some other people. Sometimes people can get pain of imagining movements. If I ask you, what did you have for dinner last night? You will get your mind back to what was there on the plate. And not just that. You might start salivating if it was good. 
you might feel oh if it was not to your choice you might think of the people you sat with you might think of the time you might think of what was going on on television the conversation it's an entire experience we keep doing this all the time isn't it it is a cognitive process of imagining posturing or moving your own body without actually moving it imagine asking someone to exercise without actually moving their body now this is the best we could do for some people where movement is painful but this has found application in other aspects as well in terms of implicit motor imagery or left right discrimination you don't know you are moving when you were judging left and right maybe you were lightly moving your hand or leg to figure out left or right but you are not aware of that in explicit imagery you know you are moving you are imagining that movement there are premotor cells active here they do not activate your primary motor cells the primary motor cells get activated here and this is why this can easily cause pain because they are a part of the pain neuro signature visualization has been used in sporting scenario for many years people often before hitting their best shot visualize hitting that shot they visualize a run they visualize what's going to happen in the next few minutes in the race etc visualization is a very powerful tool being used in sports this is a proof visualization can become pain he visualizes the trauma he went through when his girlfriend was brutally killed by someone and he causes that causes pain to him in this movie sally visualization helped save lives this was the first ever decision taking to land a plane on water that's because he visualized if he did not land now this plane would not survive and that's the power of visualization can we use this yes we can use this where all can we use this so what is involved during visualization so we have neurons which fire to watching and imagining movements and these neurons are called mirror neurons they replicate what we see it's just like the disgust you are feeling now looking at this this is activating of mirror neurons and you are feeling kind of what he must be feeling while doing that action mirror neurons have been used in experiments for long time monkeys how do they learn they see action they do action children how do they learn to smile we smile so much looking at them that eventually they imitate us of course we can go a bit further and teach them a lot more than just smiling exercise in front of mirror mirror neurons working form getting better muscles pumping more and the rush we felt when dhoni hit his last six in the world cup isn't it we felt so excited as if we were there and we hit that six that's some mirror neurons working and maybe we are feeling what he is feeling we are using visualization all the time now let's be a little more aware how it can fit in now we spoke of visualization in sports there is a role of visualization in chronic pain there is a role of visualization in your normal rehab as well isn't it let me give you some examples three three groups a study done one group is doing isometric contraction one is doing only visualization or imagining and a control group the visualization group also showed improvement so imagine imagining exercises can give results of course not long term though but there is something here 29 subjects motor imagery training low intensity training and no training at the end of 7 weeks imagery also showed increase in torque production in the calf gains post chest press and leg press one group imagine the reps between sets one group only rested result maximum improvement in mvc or maximum voluntary contraction shown in the motor imagery group compared to the motor rest group for leg press though not much result for chest press 30 volunteers they imagined lifting a weighted dumbbell and they imagined heavy concentric light concentric isometric and eccentric movement interestingly the emg activity was proportional to what they felt was heavier so emg activity was most for eccentric which is sorry heavy concentric more than light concentric this is a visual imagery or a functional mri of people who are moving their fingers and toes and you can see the imagery of fingers toes in terms of brain activity the actual movement versus the imagined movements quite similar thus in the imagery stage what we are doing is we are firing motor neurons recruiting more muscle fibers of course we are not targeting hypertrophy which needs a lot more training
don't know how much is too much in terms of inpatients. You can work on this in the gym during rehab. You can work on it with injured people, post-surgery, during immobilization for any other reason, or if they are just not feeling well. Well, you can't move the part. Can you imagine yourself moving it at least? Can work. Thus, visualization is powerful. It can help augment strength gains. Of course, it cannot replace strengthening. Maybe you can reduce the effects of deconditioning due to inactivity. The last part we use in pain management is mirror therapy, which is again, we are still not using the affected part that is behind the mirror. We are watching the image of the normal hand, moving it, doing activities with it, giving the brain the impression that the other hand is also normal. So all this is a pre-stage before we actually start moving the painful area. So mirror therapy can be devised at home with simple box and instruments. All you need is a mirror, a clear background, clear hands or legs so that you have nothing mixing it and of course following the principles of greater exposure. Okay. Mirror therapy can be extended further to the legs, to the spine. Of course, the mirror size has to be different, orientation has to be different. One, you need to understand pain, that there is more to it than just being a sensory motor phenomenon. And two, follow the process of graded motor imagery. This is probably what is lacking in terms of managing our chronic pain patients and what we have just recently introduced in India through our courses, Explain Pain and Graded Motor Imaging. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks a lot for such a great elaboration on a much needed topic. And uh, we have uh, a good learning on the recent advancement of the virtual reality training, mirror box therapy, and motor imagery technique, which are latest in the trains and most commonly used and having greatest value in the rehabilitation. So really, it was a wonderful and handsome session with uh, lots of evidences. So really, sir, we, we learned a lot in this session. It was really a wonderful and outstanding session. And uh, as we know that you are uh, uh, regularly taking the workshop and webinars on this pain management. So it was really uh, awesome and wonderful. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so wonderful. much. I hope enough was conveyed in this short time because yeah, it's yeah. Great stop. So you, you have I can talk on it for two to three days. Yeah, yeah. But I tried my best to at least give an impression about what it is about. Yes, definitely, sir. Actually, everything, everything in a very detailed way and in just a short time. So it was very difficult to uh, complete three different techniques in uh, just 45 minutes. So it is really heads up to you, sir. It was a uh, good uh, good session, great session. Thank you, Thank you, you sir. Uh, I have shared a feedback form in the chat box. So I hope uh, you may have filled the uh, feedback form uh, that is necessary to get the certificates. Now we are moving towards the next session, uh, the neurophysiotherapy, the recent advances in neurophysiotherapy by Professor Sanjeev Kumar sir. And this session would be started just after the five minutes on the different Zoom ID. And that is already sent on your mail. If you can, you have not till received the mail, you can personally WhatsApp me, I'll share it with you. And we'll meet again on the next session just at 3.15 for the neurology. And heartfelt thanks to you, sir. It was really a wonderful and outstanding session. And I have received lots of uh, good feedback for this session. The participants who are, who are joining has messaged me. It was really a wonderful and outstanding session. Thanking you, sir. Thank, Thank you to all the senior faculty members who has joined us, uh, resource person. Uh, many of the resource person are also joining us for this uh, international physiotherapy conference. Swapnila Mem also joins us. So really thankful to you for your continuous support. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you.